So welcome to the Choose 80 Zoom room, Nick. Lovely to see you. Lovely to be here. Thank you. So usually I have my partner in crime, Sue, who's not very well today, so it's just me to talk to you today. Um, But we're both really excited that we can finally say we'll be seeing you on stage soon at the Rewind Festival. Yay! Yes, it's all all very exciting. Um, It's been over 18 months since my last gig, so it's going to be emotional. (laughs) <laughs> I know. I saw your rewind video, and, and that's how you how you described it. It's going to be emotional for all of us. I think it's been yeah. a, a long time coming. What yeah, are you absolutely. looking forward to most about being on stage? I don't know. Just the. I mean, I've had a couple. Of, I had a rehearsal with my band for some other shows I'm doing, and a, a couple of weeks ago, and I had a rehearsal with the rewind band yesterday. Wow. And that that's one thing. Just playing and singing and being with your mates and, and doing doing that just doing what you do yeah you know you forget you kind of lose your identity <laughs> over a period of, period of time because you forget what you, what you've been put on this planet for pretty much so that but the thing i'm obviously really looking forward to is, is just the looking at a big big sea of faces and ho- hopefully happy ones uh, they're always colorful audience aren't they at rewind yeah. lots of costumes and well, if you had to dress up as somebody, who would you go dressed up as at Rewind? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I, well, I, I, I get away with it, really, because I went, I, I, my, my kid's school had an 80s night, had an, an 80s uh, kind of uh, themed concert they were doing, and there were parents turning up in in all sorts of gear and stuff like that. And they looked at me, I turned up in a pair of jean, jeans and a T-shirt, and I and said, well, it said, I've come as Nick Kershaw. Yeah. So I, you can get away with it, it's fine. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, so you're performing at Rewind North this weekend, aren't you? And then yeah. Rewind South on the 21st? That's correct, yeah. Well, we can't wait. We've seen you at Rewind a few times, um, and they always seem to place you on the bill where the sun's just about to go down and you sing... I won't let the sun go down on me. That's yeah. always an incredible atmosphere. Do you think that's done on purpose? <laughs> I think. Well, no, I think. I think it happened by accident first time. I think it uh, uh, kind of just just happened to be like that, you know. Um, and I think David, the promoter, looked at it yeah. and thought, "Oh, that's that's a, that's a kind of a nice moment. Maybe we can keep that in." So yeah, <laughs> I kind of. I usually end up about that time of night. It's a great time to go on as well when the. Yeah. The, the the night's closing in, the dusk is coming, the lights start kicking in, and you can really see what's going. It's a really kind of a, a real kind of electricity in the air at that time of night. It's very really cool at festivals. Definitely, and that's such a great song. It was it was held off the top spot by Frankie's um, Two Tribes, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yeah and if I it's going to be held off the top spot by any song, that song was the longest running number one of the eighties. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I just. I've, randomly going through my news feed this morning and there's an article in the guardian about that particular song for some oh, reason really? yeah no, fantastic track <laughs> but you did get to number one recently with your track from your new album oxymoron from cloudy bay to malibu that's number yeah. one on the heritage chart wasn't it they, they all count <laughs> yeah they, they do all count <laughs> so that was an interesting song was that something you wrote during lockdown as a fantasy of traveling to loads of different countries but doing it through no, it wasn't. No. But none of the, I mean, there's a few. There's a few moments on the album where people go, "Oh, they, that's written June lockdown," you know, because yeah. it's got sort of it, it kind of resonates with what we were all going through at that time. But they were all written, you know, in some cases years before. I mean, I've just taken me eight years to finish that album. So you know, and it was all done and dusted by last January. So ah, uh-huh. I can't claim that any of the songs were, no. were written in or are about lockdown no not at all so it's just about song particular songs just a random song about i mean the words kind of all around the world came to me and but i've already got a song called all around the world that i wrote for jason donovan so i thought i can't call it that what am i going to call it? and what's this song about anyway and 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 it just sort of occurred to me i just sort of um just words start coming out and they just happen to be names of drinks <laughs> What is your favourite tipple, by the way? Do it. I'm, I'm a vodka. I do like my vodka with various mixes. I've, I've got this. There's a really beautiful vanilla vodka out at the moment Ooh. that I'm kind of. I like vodka too. I'd have to try best. that one. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so yeah, that's the song about basically travelling the world, the world through the medium of alcoholic beverages. Yeah, which yep. we've all done. You know. Yeah. <laughs> 
And that, another song we really like is I Do Believe. It's got a real sort of classic Nick okay. Kershaw vibe to it. What, which right. song of the album do you like, the most, are you most proud of? Oh, that's, that's tricky. There's there's quite a few on there. There's a there's a song I wrote with a percussionist called um, Paul Clavis called um, uh, The Wind Will Blow. And I, I just really yeah. love the way that one came out. And it's just kind of almost got a kind of a kind of a prog rock sea shanty thing going on there it's it's it's, it's I, I really enjoy that there's a, another song i love um i love but well, i love i grow, grow in and out of love of, of a lot of them really you know and uh, you kind of um you end up hating them all at one point okay, by the time <laughs> you, you've heard them all sort of 300 times before and by the time the album comes out you're going on and you've got then you've got to promote it and say nice things about your own music and that can be quite a struggle sometimes. But then you, there's a bit of a gap, and then you, it's like I listen to albums I made in 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 sort of 1998 and and 2000 and stuff, and I think, yeah, that's really good. That, <laughs> yeah. but at the time I probably didn't you know. You recorded it. the album at the Abbey Road Studios, didn't you? You've been there before with Chesney Hawks with, when you recorded yeah. the one and only. What's it like to be in somewhere that's like the holy grail of music? It's a really... fabulous studio, yeah. There, I mean, there's lots of um, lots of iconic studios, especially in and around London, that have that are sadly um, no longer with us because of the way the music's recorded now, music technology, yeah. and well, the way the business is. Um, but that one survived, yeah. That and Air Studios and, and another couple of notable studios have survived. But uh, Abbey Road is obviously special because the because the Beatles were there, and you just sort of wandering past the bits of junk in in the corridor and yeah. you go what's that and so that's the mixing test that they recorded sergeant pepper on and stuff uh, so much it's mega just, history uh, there yeah absolutely so it is a special place and then it's also just a lovely place to to hang out because it's yeah. just down in the canteen in and the bar in of, of an evening it's just it's just a magical <laughs> place so from music studio to television studio going back to the 80s what was it like to be on top of the pops I've been in the audience 11 yeah. times, Have so really? I know what it's like in there. But right. what was it like to perform there, say, for the first time? It was pretty surreal, I must admit, because, you know, I mean, I'd grown up on every Thursday night, whatever night of the week it was on when I was a kid. It was a big was, deal, you know, that and the old grey whistle test. Yeah. Always made sure that if you saw one thing on a telly, it was that every week. Um so yeah, it was a bit. It was a bit odd. Um, I must admit, because you get there and you you've got this vision of what you you know. You've, you've got the vision yeah. of this this huge studio with all these <laughs> you know, these big stages and all these massive. And it's tiny, right? It's the yeah. studio is absolutely tiny, and you're all squeezed in there. And you've and there's a and, and you think there's hundreds of people in the audience, and there's like about twenty. Yeah, you've been moved from stage to stage. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then and miraculously, no one's getting their head cut off with by boom stands and cameras that are whizzing about all over the place yeah but it was um yeah just being there with i can't even remember who was on with me the first the first the first time but it was it was i do remember getting pulled over by the police on the way there because for jumping the traffic lights no <laughs> yeah did and you say I'm, me, I'm in a rush yeah well, exactly they asked me where i was going in a hurry and i told them i went yes sir <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> so there you go did they let you off nick no they didn't let me off but no. you know, they didn't lock me up at least i still got to top of the pops so did you mix with other acts backstage at top of the pops or were you in your own dressing room and you just stayed there Pento was on really i, I come there was there was kind of there was a lot of um a lot of pouting going on and a lot of um stand up standoffishness by by certain acts other acts you just end up in the bar just because because it, when it was live yeah. dangerously um that we, we we all ended up in the bar sort of about two hours beforehand so, <laughs> that, I don't was know how dangerous. People, that was dangerous yeah so you know you, that that was great and a lot of the acts did that but there were there were certain you know certain acts that, that who didn't talk to other certain acts you know there's a bit of that going on yeah, it's quite, quite hilarious to see it. You know. <laughs> Did you get to meet any of your own idols through Top of the Pops? Um, uh, I I did. I remember meeting Sting for the first time um, at Top of the Pops. I think I think that was when we were doing the. Do they? It was. Do they know it's Christmas was out? I 
thing yeah. and they wheeled loads of people in to mime it and <laughs> and sting was on there and uh i think i was on stage with him miming it as well because i didn't sing on the actual record now why was um, that nick I, I just didn't get the phone call i, I was oh. kind of a bit, i was a bit of a new boy yeah. i must admit i don't i just don't think i was in bob geldof's file effects Oh, so a year I, later, and you most definitely would have cool. been, because you were at live oh, eight, weren't you? Yeah, well, a, a month later, I bumped yeah. in, you know bumped into Bob in a in a in, in, in the airport, and he, he you know press ganged me into to live eight, yeah. <laughs> and that was in, it, absolutely terrifying, as you say, but it mm. must have been one of those standout moments of your life that you'll never forget. The moment when you stepped on stage. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm not allowed to forget it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you, people want to know about it. You know, they bumped me into it. So you played at Live Aid, didn't you? What was that like? Ah. Um, so, yeah, and, and then you sort of watch a film like Bohemian Rhapsody uh, again and, and, and they've recreated that whole thing with Freddie walking on stage yeah. and stuff. And I just got goosebumps all over again. I thought, blimey, that was that was really... It was a special day, absolutely, and it was a complete privilege to have been there. Yeah. So Elton John once described you as one of the greatest songwriters of the time. Um, how did that feel to have someone like El- Elton John singing your praises? He was, yeah, he, d- he didn't believe me. But the first first record I actually bought with my own pocket money was was your song. Uh-huh. Um, so um, so it was, a, it was a bit special. It's kind of he he was brilliant um, f- to me for uh, for a, for a couple of years when. I think I was playing the, a gig at, at Wembley Stadium in, in 1984. There was, a, look, I think it was called the Summer of '84 or something. It was like a Radio One sponsored thing, uh, and he was headlining it, and I was on it. And he he, he always takes a huge interest in in new acts and stuff. He still does. Um, and I just happened to be doing promotion in in Paris. And he was playing a gig that night, and he invited us to the gig, and and um, you know, we got to know him there, and he he was just he was a great champion for me, yeah, uh, during that period, and and yeah, and then I ended up playing on Nikita, and yeah, so you did you do backing vocals as well on that? No, that was George. No. Oh, was that George Michael? George Michael, yeah. No, I was yeah. just chugging away on guitar. So- in your honour, Nick, we've introduced a new question today, which is okay. um, legendary l- lyrics. This is where we pick out a standout um, lyric from an artist back catalogue and just like to know the story behind the one sentence lyric, if, if that's at all possible. So your okay. one is from I Won't oh, Let The Sun Go Down On Me. And yep. it's the song that when we're in the crowd, everybody sings this line. Old men in striking trousers rule the world with plastic smiles. Right. Can you explain a bit more about that enigmatic line? Um, I think it was it was just stripy trousers, a bit like pinstripe trousers, yeah. in, in the time when politicians um, wore bowler hats and and pinstripes, basically. Yeah. So it's it's about politicians and and um, the whole song is kind of uh, most people don't know what the song was about, and, and it doesn't matter, you know, because they they think it's. And he gets wheeled out every every summer on the radio, and it's a nice summery, yeah, feel good yeah. song, right? Yeah, but it, it, it but originally, when when I wrote it, it was a protest song, and it was it was kind of a a, a song about nu- nuclear disarmament, you know, just because it was we were yeah. all going to be destroyed in a massive nuclear hol- holocaust at the time, you know, and it, that, everybody forgets that that was that was kind of in the air. That was quite. Yeah. A, big thing and there were marches left right and center and C and D was a big thing um so it was yeah it was just a, a, probably a very naive and a very kind of um idealistic lyric about not letting that happen I did read that you you said before about the the way you sing the chorus wasn't exactly how you would have liked to have done the chorus it wasn't as upbeat yeah I think it was right? Yeah, it, it it was because we, we, we recorded it and then we um, we sent the first mix in and the A&R man thought, well, no, it didn't. The, the chorus didn't. Exp- the chorus needs to explode right. himself. Yeah. His local Charlie Air, bless him. Um, and we sent the second one back and there's no, it didn't explode enough. So we just kind of, it, we, we tried a third mix and just the vocals were really loud and everything was really up and it was really... It, I put more harmonies on it and it just turned into this 
huge kind of poppy jolly kind of thing and 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 at the time i, I just I, it wasn't kind of originally ha as it was intended put it that way but it didn't do me any harm did it no it was an ama amazing song i think however you did it nick it would have been brilliant and finally um do you still wear snoods because obviously they'd be quite good, <laughs> quite apt at this time with the pandemic yeah, I got. I, I, I remember getting. A, I got a call a couple of years ago when footballers started wearing them. I got a call from Radio Five Live. Said, Would you come and talk about snooze? I said no. <laughs> I really want. I do, I, but I have to admit, I, there are occasions when I always, where I wear a snood, high waisted trousers, um, and braces uh, at the same time, and that's when <laughs> when I'm skiing. Because <laughs> you're allowed to in salopettes. Yeah. With braces, isn't it? Snood. Oh. <laughs> great oh thanks so much nick we really look forward to seeing you at rewind we really can't wait honestly it's cannot wait um are you touring at the end of the year at all uh I'm, nobody's brave enough to put a tour together yet i think it's no. still early days but um hopefully maybe next year i'll put a few dates together because i got obviously we didn't re tour the album no. uh, and that might be a nice thing to do just do even do just to do four or five dates around the country just to do that that would be fun i think oh but we'll see. watch this place oh let's hope so let's hope we're getting back to normal it'd be yeah. so lovely to see you rewind hope it goes well enjoy Brilliant. and we'll talk lovely. to you again lovely talking to you oh Cheers. and you nick thanks a lot bye, bye.